environment and ecology there is approximately 50 marks in prelims examination and cutoff is mostly around 100 marks so environment and ecology is important last four chapters of class 12 biology can make your concepts clear and you can find most of the questions coming out from this source and not only that concept that you will learn you can apply those concept in the rest of the questions to solve multiple choice questions this series can help you in elimination of those options anyone who wants to learn basic environment and ecology can watch this video series even if you are neat aspirant upsc aspirant or class 12 student or giving any competitive exams such as cds capf or any state services this series is for you here we will revise organisms and population in detail with the help of nodes in under 30 minutes and similarly we can cover the next three chapters as well so without a further ado let us begin unity in diversity represents our country india is colorful we have deserts mountain glaciers hill stations rivers forest beaches and islands we have diversity in species too very environment around you is diverse in this chapter we will learn how different organisms adapt and adjust with first other organisms and second environment itself and their ultimate goal is often survival at any level of biological environment we can ask two types of questions that is how and why now you guys know bulbul she is able to produce beautiful melodies now i have two questions how a bulbul sings and secondly why a bulbul sings early in the morning the answer will be vocal cord in the first question and in the second one to communicate so bulbul sings with the help of vocal cord to communicate the point is how type questions seek mechanism while why type questions seeks purpose now how sociology teaches us interaction of various communities similar to that ecology is a subject which studies the interaction among organisms and between the organism and its physical environment that is abiotic environment ecology is basically concerned with four levels of biological organizations first organisms second populations third communities and lastly biomes in this chapter we explore ecology at organismic and population level that is first two now organism and its environment ecology at the organismic level that is the first level itself is essentially physiological ecology which tries to understand how different organisms are adapted to their environments in terms of not only survival but also reproduction let us imagine a class where every kind of student is present padaku multi talented sports person but everyone has to pass in order to get promoted to next standard irrespective of their iq background and interest everyone has to survive similarly every organism has to survive irrespective of variation this variation can be variation in temperature rainfall humidity salinity etc now why is there variation in our planet at the first place the rotation of our planet around the sun and the tilt of its axis causes annual variations in the temperature resulting in distinct seasons due to differences in rainfall temperature and other factors it is not like that only moderate climate of goa is suitable for life life exists in the hot climate of rajasthan too it also exists in the rain soaked meghalaya forest and also in the deep ocean trenches let us take the example of our indian soldiers our respected soldiers serve the nation in minus 16 degrees without adequate facilities they are also humans and still they are surviving you will be amazed to know that even our intestine is a unique habitat for hundreds of species of microbes over a period of time through natural selection and evolution an organism adapts itself for survival and reproduction example is us our ancestors had tails but they got rid of it because when they moved away from trees to plains to more nomadic lifestyle functional role of tail reduced and eventually we got rid of it similarly giraffe 
Giraffe has evolved long necks because successive generations realized that extra vertebrae helped them to get access to tender leaves on top of trees. That is why they have long necks. Some studies also say that the smallest finger or pinky finger will not be there in the future. Why? Because it is contributing less to our workings. Now let us discuss some of the basic terms which will help you in understanding this chapter. Environment Environment means our surroundings. Like we can say about the environment of our room or hostel. Usually we say my working environment is not so cooperative. एक इधर से टांग खींच रहा है तो एक उधर से और इन हॉस्टल समर्स के टाइम बहुत गर्मी होती है एंड ऑन टॉप ऑफ इट आपका रूममेट आपको कुछ उल्टा सीधा पीने को इन्फ्लुएंस करता है सो वी कैन से दैट एनवायरमेंट इज नॉट सो कोऑपरेटिव फॉर स्टडीज सो एनवायरमेंट मीन्स अवर सराउंडिंग्स दैट इंक्लूड्स बोथ बायोटिक एंड ए बायोटिक फैक्टर्स बायोटिक मीन्स ह्यूमन बींग्स एनिमल्स और एनी लिविंग थिंग विच इज सराउंडिंग अस and abiotic means factors such as sunlight soil temperature which are non living things next ecosystem what makes a home a home its members feelings that we exchange food that we share sense of belongingness also material goods such as tv ac fridge etc and daily interaction and all same way ecosystem is sum total of biotic and abiotic components of a particular geographical area it is a functional unit of nature here living organisms interact among themselves and surrounding nature they exchange energies and recycling of nutrients take place in the environment now what is habitat in your city your society is your habitat it is a place where an organism or population of an organism lives and reproduces example For polar bears, Arctic sea and surrounding glaciers are their habitat, and many habitat combined together make an environment. Now remember that reproduction is equally important to survival. Actually, the apparent goal of every organism is to fill the available space with its offspring. So, habitat is a place where you live and reproduce. Now, what is ecology? Ecology is a branch of biology which studies interaction between organisms and between organism and surroundings. Now, what is biosphere? The biosphere is made up of the part of earth where life exists. The biosphere extends from the deepest root systems of trees to the dark environment of ocean trenches to the lush rainforest and high mountain tops. Since life exists on the ground in the air and in the water the biosphere overlaps all these spheres now let us discuss the next term that is carrying capacity the maximum number of organisms of a population that can be sustained by a given habitat for example how many organism can resources support if resources are enough for 5 but there are 8 people if there are 8 people and resources are of for 5 people then we can say that given habitat is overpopulated and it is beyond carrying capacity of that habitat now one of the most important concept ecological niche that is the role of an organism in an ecosystem where it lives let me give you an simple example the society in which you are living is your habitat you are a student so your functional role is you eat you play and you study if you are an policeman you maintain law and order this is how you contribute and make impact now this is for your understanding now let us take more conventional example of dung beetle dung beetles eat dung dung is plentiful in almost all biomes dung beetle eats that dung and make a ball out of it it feeds on it and female lay their eggs on that ball by doing so they provide nutrition to soil so this is a functional role of a dung beetle in environment they eat the dung so their stomach gets filled and they provide nutrition to soil now what is biome a biome is a large community of vegetation and wildlife adopted to a specific climate so it is a community adopted to a specific climate it is a large area characterized by its vegetation soil climate and wildlife 
so each biome has a special characteristic they have specific vegetation specific soil specific climate and wildlife there are five major types of biomes aquatic grassland forest desert and tundra though some of these biomes can be further divided into more specific categories such as fresh water marine water savanna tropical rainforest temperate rainforest taiga and so on now let us move to the next sub topic that is major abiotic factors the first one is temperature have you ever asked your mama why she doesn't put curd in the freezer to get set the most interesting example is from our daily life only in freezer organism will not be able to tolerate less temperature and the result will be less reproduction of organisms and the curd will be imperfect i hope you got the point temperature variation can be so high that temperature ranges from sub zero levels in polar areas and high altitudes to 500 degrees celsius in tropical deserts in summer there are however unique habitats such as thermal springs and deep sea hydrothermal vents where average temperature exceeds 1000 degrees celsius now let us move to the next concept now some of your friends get angry even at very small things but some of them are cool and are very flexible and can tolerate any nuisance of yours there are yours yuri friends similar concept applies here a few organisms can tolerate and thrive in a wide range of temperature they are yuri thermals example includes man goat and cow and a vast majority of them are restricted to narrow range of temperature they are stenothermals example include reptiles crustaceans insects salmons penguins python crocodile etc these are stenothermals now next important abiotic factor is water jal hi jeevan hai the famous slogan of jal jeevan mission of a water ministry used in every template itself signifies the importance of water its availability is so limited in desert that only special adaptations make it possible for organisms to live there the productivity distribution of plants is also heavily dependent on water now for aquatic organisms the quality of water is also important quality means the chemical composition and ph level of the water the salt concentration is also measured as salinity in parts per thousand is also important the salinity which is measured in parts per thousand is less than 5 in inland waters 30 to 35 in the seas and more than 100 in some hypersaline lagoons now some water species sab kuch sahan kar lete hain and they are called urihaline examples of urihalines are oysters clams etc and some water species are very sensitive to salinity of water examples are coral reefs and goldfish now let us move to the next important abiotic factor that is light since plants produce food through photosynthesis a process which is only possible when sunlight is available as a source of energy we can quickly understand the importance of light for living organisms particularly autotrophs autotrophs khud ka khana khud bana lete hain many species of small plants herbs and shrubs growing in forest are adopted to photosynthesis optimally under very low light conditions because they are constantly overshadowed by tall canopied trees many plants are also dependent on sunlight to meet their photoperiodic requirement for flowering but imagine deep in the oceans even in those benthic areas where sunlight is not adequate we find life there waha light kon bhejta hai what then is the source of energy there now some of them feed on dead animal carcasses that sink deep after dying and some feed on chemicals coming out from deep sea vents now the next important factor is soil variation can be found in soils too it is dependent on the climate the weathering process whether soil is transported or sedimentary in nature and how soil development has occurred various characteristic of the soil such as soil composition grain size and aggregation determine the percolation and water holding capacity of the soils these characteristics along with parameters such as ph level mineral composition and topography determine to a large extent what kind of vegetation that soil can support in any given area this in turn 
dictates the type of animal that can be supported. Similarly, in the aquatic environment, the sediment characteristic often determine the type of benthic animals that can thrive on that type of soil. Now we learned about abiotic factors such as water, sunlight and soil. Now let us learn about responses to these abiotic factors by organisms. How do the organisms living in such habitats cope or manage with stressful conditions and variation in these abiotic factors? During the course of millennium of years, species would have evolved a relatively constant internal environment that permits all biochemical reactions and psychological functions to proceed with maximal efficiency and this enhances the overall fitness of the species. Now, what is homeostasis? It is a self-regulating process by which an organism tends to maintain stability while adjusting to conditions that are best for its survival. Now, this definition is important and it will be the basis for the next conversation. Now, depending on the responses to abiotic factors, we find two types of organisms, regulators and conformers. And there are another two types that we will discuss further. The first one is regulate. Organisms maintain homeostasis by ensuring constant body temperature, that is thermoregulation, and constant osmotic concentration, that is osmoregulation. For example, mammals regulate temperature by shivering in cold and sweating in heat. Now let us take a simple example. While going in a congested bus, you regulate according to the seat which is available to you. Agar seat pura ka pura khali hai, to aap fail ke baitte ho, or if there are two or three people, you adjust as per the size and availability of space. So you are flexible in this regard. Similarly, humans live both in polar regions as well as in the tropical deserts of Sahara and they are successful in doing so because they can adjust or maintain a constant body temperature. In summer we sweat because our outside temperature is more than body temperature and in winters we start to shiver which produces heat and raises the body temperature. But ye to humne apna soch liya. What about plants? Have you ever seen them shivering? Is it possible for them to maintain body temperature? Now let us move to the next category that is conformers. 99% of animals and nearly all plants cannot maintain a constant internal environment. And that's why they have not evolved to become regulators. This is a very similar to concept that I cannot afford an air conditioner so I simply conform to surrounding temperature. But we are regulators, our internal AC maintains our temperature. But see, the point I am trying to make is that as AC is expensive, similarly thermoregulation is energetically expensive for many organisms. Small animals like shrews or hummingbirds are conformers because they are relatively too small. The heat they produce is significantly less and not enough to keep them warm enough. As small animals have larger surface area relative to their volume, they tend to lose body heat very fast when it is cold outside. Then they have to expand much energy to generate body heat through metabolism. This is the main reason why very small animals are rarely found in polar regions. Some species have evolved the ability to regulate, but only over a limited range of environmental conditions beyond which they simply conform. If they cannot afford even this, they are left with only two alternatives, that is to migrate or to suspend. Now migrate. This is to avoid the stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when the stressful period is over. Now, you also have class when the boring teacher ka period is over. In human analogy, this strategy is like persons moving from Delhi to Shimla for the duration of summer or Russians moving to Goa during the harsh winters. Many animals, particularly birds, during winter undertake long distance migration to more hospitable areas. Every winter, the famous Kevla Dev National Park of Bharatpur, Rajasthan is a host to thousands of migratory birds coming from Siberia and other extreme cold northern regions. The next is suspend. 
when you cannot migrate you surrender the case of bears going into hibernation during the winter is an example of escape in time they cannot migrate so they hibernate they save their energy instead of wasting that energy in search of food now there is a very famous story related to kumbhakarna in ramayana kumbhakarna used to eat a lot and just to save the food he slept for 6 months every year similar to that hibernation is a way for many creatures from butterflies to bats to bears to survive the cold dark winters without having to search for food or to migrate somewhere else aestivation is the similar condition in which other species such as earthworms frogs snails salamanders crocodiles which are present in warm tropical latitudes they survive hard summers by finding a moist and shady place to suspend in order to avoid heat related problems this is also known as summer sleep similar concept is diapause it is a period of suspended development in an insect other vertebrate or mammal embryo especially during unfavorable environmental conditions now let us move to the next important concept that is adaptations you have to adjust when you visit your relatives home or when guests come to your home you stay silent for some time until you get acclimatized you adapt to the situation same here adaptation is the biological mechanism by which organisms adjust to new environments or change in environment to ensure survival there is a mind blowing example in the absence of an internal and external source of water a kangaroo rat in the north american desert is capable of meeting water requirements through its internal fat oxidation and the by product of that fat oxidation is a water it also has the ability to concentrate its urine so that minimal volume of water is used to remove excretory products so this is how the kangaroo rat saves water now there are four types of adaptations number 1 physiological adaptation it allows organism to respond quickly to a stressful situation have you ever wondered when you go to high altitudes why you suffer altitude sickness its symptoms include nausea fatigue and heart palpitations it is because our body doesn't get enough oxygen so the body compensates low oxygen availability by increasing red blood cell production so in turn this decreases the binding affinity of hemoglobin and increases the breathing rate there are such native tribes which live in himalayas they normally have a higher red blood cell count because they have adapted themselves to that environment next is behavioral adaptations it is change in your normal behavior to cope with the situation examples bear hibernating birds migrating is an example of behavioral adaptation also there are biochemical adaptations now uv rays are bad for humans now this melanin acts as a protective biological shield against ultraviolet radiation by doing this it helps to prevent sunburn damage that could result in dna changes and subsequently several kind of malignant skin cancers this is an example of biochemical adaptation these are the changes to the structure function regulation and integration of biological molecules and metabolic processes the final is morphological adaptations a structural change which gives an organism a greater chance of survival in its habitat for example fennec fox lives in the desert its structural adaptation is to have large ears this allows heat to be radiated from the body and helping to cool it down similar to that the tropical elephants have large ears whereas polar bear has small ears now let us move to the second part of the chapter that is populations in nature we rarely find isolated single individuals of any species the majority of them live in the groups in a well defined geographical area they share similar resources and interbreed and because of that they constitute a population actually the apparent goal of every organism is to fill the available space with its offspring we discussed that earlier some examples of population are all the rats in the abandoned dwelling teak wood trees in the forest tract bacteria in a culture plate and lotus plants in pond 
and all the humans living in the land of India or any geographical entity. Now population ecology is therefore an important area because it links ecology to population genetics and evolution. Now here we will understand some terms related to populations. Number one, sex ratio. The sex ratio is the ratio of males to females in a population. Now, according to the recently released economic survey, India has more females as compared to males. It stands at 1020 females per 1000 males. Next is age pyramid. In population, everyone is of not the same age. There are some younger ones, some elders and so on. So if age distribution is plotted for a population, the result will be an age pyramid. The shape of the pyramid reflects the growth status of the population, whether it is growing, whether it is stable or whether it is declining. Most of the African countries having growing populations. USA and China ki population budi hoti ja rahi hai. Similar to that, Japan is having declining population pyramid. So let us move to the next concept that is population density. Population density is the concentration of individuals within a species in a specific geographic area. Population density of Bihar is relatively high as compared to Sikkim because more population is concentrated in relatively smaller area. The density of population in a given habitat during a given period fluctuates due to changes in four basic processes that is natality, immigration, mortality and emigration. First to contribute to an increase and last to contribute to decrease. Now what is population growth? Population growth is the increase in the number of people in population over a period of time. Now what is natality? Natality refers to the number of births during a given period of the population that are added to the initial density. For example, number of births per 1000 individuals of population. Now what is mortality? It is the number of deaths in the population during given period of time. For example, number of deaths per 1000 individuals of population. Now what is immigration with I? It is the number of individuals of the same species that have come into the habitat from elsewhere during the time period under consideration. Example, someone comes in our locality for living. The next is emigration that is, it is the number of individuals of the population who left the habitat and gone somewhere during the time period under consideration. Now population density will increase if the number of birth plus the number of immigrants that is natality and immigration is more than the number of deaths plus the number of immigrants that is mortality and immigration. But in normal circumstances birth and death rates are most influencing factors in the population growth. Now let us discuss the growth models. Population of species when it increases or decreases show their creativity. Now there are two types of growth models. One is exponential growth model and another is logistic growth model. Now exponential growth model is related to the growth of population where resources are not limited. And when resources are unlimited, the population grows exponentially. But this is unrealistic. There is always a resource crunch in environment. After one point, organisms start competing for resources then the fittest individual will survive and reproduce. In case of logistic growth, a population growing in a habitat with a limited resources shows initially a lag phase followed by phase of acceleration and then deceleration and finally an asymptote when the population density reaches the carrying capacity. The shape of logistic growth is sigmoid. Now let us discuss the life history variation. Why populations evolve? to maximize their reproductive fitness, also called as Darwinian fitness. That is why populations evolve. Some organisms breed once in a while, others breed many times. Some produce a large number of small sized offspring, while others produce small number of large sized offspring. Now which is desirable? Which is going to maximize fitness? Ecologists suggest that life history traits of organisms have evolved in a relation to the constraints imposed by the abiotic and biotic components of the habitat in which they live. Now let us discuss the last important concept that is population interactions. There is no such habitat on the earth that is inhabited just by a single species. The minimum requirement is one 
more species on which it can feed. Even a plant cannot survive alone, जबकि वो तो खुद का खाना खुद बनाते हैं A plant needs soil microbes to break down the organic matter in soil and return the inorganic nutrients for absorption. And then, how will the plant manage pollination without an animal agent? How it will reproduce? So it is not possible for any species to live in isolation. It is like sabka saath, sabka vikas. Interspecific interactions arise from the interaction of population of two different species. They could be beneficial, detrimental or neutral to each other. Where both species will benefit, jahan dono ka fayda ho, usse kehte hai mutualism. Jahan dono ka nuksan ho, that is called as competition. In both parasitism and predation, only one species is benefited. The interaction where one species is benefited and the other is neither benefited nor harmed is called commensalism. Dusre ko kuch farag hi nahi padta. In amensalism, on the other hand, one species is harmed or destroyed, whereas the other species is unaffected. It is like a one-sided love story. Now let us discuss each in detail. Predation. It is beneficial to predators while prey is harmed. Ek ka fayda hota hai, ek ka pura ka pura nuksan. One gets destroyed. The more traditional example is where a lion eats a deer, but a sparrow eating any seed is also a predator. And some plants which eat insects are also predators. Predators don't only transform energy, they play many important roles also. They keep prey population under control. Otherwise, prey species may have achieved a very high population density and have caused instability in the ecosystem. When certain exotic species are introduced into a geographical area, they become invasive and start spreading fast because the invaded land does not have its natural predators. And there is such a relatable example that prickly pear cactus, which was introduced into Australia in the early 1920s, caused havoc by spreading rapidly into millions of hectares of rangeland. Finally, the invasive cactus was brought under control only after a cactus feeding predator, a moth from its natural habitat was introduced into the country. Now wait. What if predators are so efficient and because of this prey species got extinct and also predator becomes extinct because of lack of food? The thing is that actual predators in nature are prudent than efficient. They are wise because of if they are efficient, they will clear all prey population and eventually run out of food. So predators in the nature are prudent. Some species of insects and frogs are cryptically colored, that is camouflaged, to avoid being detected easily by the predator. Some are poisonous and therefore avoided by predators. The monarch butterfly is highly distasteful to its predator because of a special chemical present in its body. Interestingly, the butterfly acquires this chemical during its caterpillar stage by feeding on a poisonous weed. Now the next interaction is competition. You can say competition occurs when closely related species compete for the same resource that are limiting. But this is not set in stone. Firstly, totally unrelated species could also compete for the same resource. For instance, in some shallow South American lakes, visiting flamingos and resident fishes compete for the common food that is the zooplankton in the lake. Secondly, resources need not be limiting for competition to occur. In interference competition, the feeding efficiency of one species might be reduced due to the interfering and inhibitory presence of other species, even if resources are abundant. Competition is best defined as process in which the fitness of one species is significantly lower in the presence of another species. The abundant tortoise in Galapagos Island become extinct within a decade after goats were introduced on the island, apparently due to the greater browsing efficiency of the goats. A species whose distribution is restricted to small geographical area because of the presence of competitively superior species is found to expand its distributional range dramatically when the competing species is experimentally remote. देखो बड़ा भाई बाहर चला जाता है तो छोटा भाई दादागिरी तो करता है ना नाउ नेक्स्ट कॉन्सेप्ट 
Gauche's competitive exclusion principle. It states that two closely related species competing for the same resource cannot coexist indefinitely and the competitively inferior one will be eliminated eventually. One such mechanism is resource partition. Aadha tera, aadha mera. If two species compete for the same resource, they could avoid competition by choosing, for instance, different times for feeding or different foraging partners. MacArthur showed that five closely related species of wobblers, a bird, living on the same tree were able to avoid competition and coexist due to their behavioral difference in their foraging that is searching of food activities. The next interaction is parasitism. Have you ever listened to the famous dialogue Jiski thali mein khata hai, usi thali mein wo chhed karta hai. This is perfect definition of parasitism. One organism, the parasite, lives on or inside another organism that is lives inside the host or on it and causing it harm. The parasite is adapted structurally to this way of life. Many parasites have evolved to be host specific. They can parasites only a single species of host in such a way that both host and the parasite tend to co-evolve. That is, if the host evolve special mechanism for rejecting or resisting the parasite, the parasite has to evolve mechanism to counteract and naturalize them in order to be successful with the same host species. Examples are helminthus, that is worms in the intestine of the host and they suck nutrients, lice in the human head, plasmodium species transmitted by anophelian mosquito and causing malaria in humans. Majority of the parasite harm the host. They may reduce the survival, growth and reproduction of the host and reduce its population density. They might render the host more vulnerable to predation by making it physically weak. Parasites that feed on the external surface of the host organism are called ectoparasites. The most familiar examples of this group are the lice or lice on humans and ticks on dogs. Now there are also endoparasites that live inside the host. Endoparasites are those parasites that live inside the host body at different sites like liver, kidney, lungs, red blood cells, etc. The life cycle of endoparasites are more complex because of their extreme specialization. Now let us move to the another interaction that is commensalism. This is the interaction in which one species benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. Ek ka fayda aur dusre ka matlab bhi nahi. For example, an orchid growing as an epiphyte on a mango branch and barnacles growing on the back of a well benefit while neither the mango tree nor the well derives any apparent benefit from this interaction. Another example of commensalism is the interaction between sea anemone that has the stinging tentacles and the clownfish that lives among them. The fish gets protection from the predators which stay away from the stinging tentacles. The anemone does not appear to derive any benefit by hosting the clownfish. Now let us move to the another interaction that is mutualism. This interaction confers benefits on the both interacting species. This is the best deal For example, lichens represent an intimate mutualistic relationship between the fungus and photosynthesizing algae or a cyanobacteria. Here the fungi provide a moist sheltered habitat for the cyanobacteria or algae and in turn algae provide food for the fungi. Similarly, plants need the help of animals for pollinating their flowers and dispersing their seeds. Animals obviously have to be paid fees for the services that plants expect from them. Plants offer rewards or fees in the form of pollen and nectar for pollinators and juicy and nutritious fruits for seed dispersers. But the sad truth is cheaters are present everywhere. For example, animals that try to steal nectar without aiding in pollination. Now this is all from this chapter. Now let us discuss some things that are uh, left to be discussed like sexual deceit. Sexual deceit is an example of mutualism in which the flower behaves like the female insect to attract the male insect for pollination. Example is orchid flowers are modified in such a way that 
one petal of the flower resembles the female insect now what is cam that is crassulation acid metabolism it is also known as cam photosynthesis is a carbon fixation pathway that evolved in some plants as adaptation to arid conditions that allows a plant to photosynthesize during the day but exchange of gases took place at night it mostly evolves in arid conditions now what are phenotypic adaptation phenotypic adaptation involves changes in the body of an organism in response to genetic mutation or certain environmental changes these responsive adjustment occur in an organism in order to cope with environmental conditions present in their natural habitats in this video we are going to discuss the second chapter of the environment and ecology that is ecosystem here we will brush up some definition which can be potential question in the exam then we shall discuss energy pyramids then ecological succession and finally we will deal with nutrient cycles that is carbon cycle and phosphorus cycle now take your pen and paper and follow along with me take running notes and revise those notes again talking about the ecosystem in simpler words an ecosystem is where living organisms live together and interact with each other it is simple right let us add on with a better definition we can say that the ecosystem is when biotic and abiotic components have a well stable physical environment and interact with each other biotic means living things and abiotic means non living things for example if your classroom is an ecosystem you and your friends are the biotic components and the benches duster chalk are the abiotic components now an ecosystem can be a small pond or a whole forest or the whole of the earth is also considered as an ecosystem to study the ecosystem more clearly we define the ecosystem into two major categories terrestrial and aquatic forest deserts and grasslands are terrestrial ecosystems and ponds lakes rivers are all aquatic ecosystems it is simple an ecosystem based on water is aquatic and if it is based on land then it is terrestrial one moving on let's get to know about a new term and that is stratification now in an ecosystem there are many species of organisms right so for a more clear study we distribute different species on different levels arranged vertically taking an example a tree would be arranged on the topmost level the next would be shrubs and the herbs and grass would be on the lower most level the next thing we need to learn about is the factors due to which all the components of the ecosystem work as a single unit so what is it that binds them together their needs and requirements are right they all must have some dependency on each other due to which all of them are staying together don't you think so that binding factor is productivity now productivity here refers to production the rate of biomass production is called productivity talking about production let's define primary production primary production is referred to as the total amount of biomass produced by the producers that is here the process of production is fast and it occurs in photosynthesis producers are where the photosynthesis occurs these are the plants for example but when consumers produce the organic matter it is called secondary productivity it occurs on herbivores and omnivores now you may ask what is biomass biomass is nothing but organic matter also every component of the ecosystem requires sunlight or solar energy as a basic requirement now how does productivity relate to solar power for that let me tell you what is gross primary productivity in an ecosystem it is the rate of production of organic matter during photosynthesis and for photosynthesis we again require solar energy so it makes sense now right better last but not the least important term under this topic is net primary productivity the name may sound complicated 
but indeed is a really simple thing if we go by the bookish definition net primary productivity that is npp is gross primary productivity minus the respiratory losses like in economy gross means the total or whole amount of something whereas net means what remains from the whole after certain deductions are made for example ndp that is net domestic product is equal to gdp that is gross domestic product minus depreciation from capital goods so net primary productivity is equal to gross primary productivity minus the respiratory losses so the next factor which binds an ecosystem is decomposition you may ask how decomposition before moving on let me tell you some basic terms so we can understand decomposition better first is a producer organism that produce their own food and nutritional requirements are producers for example plants then comes the consumer organisms feeding on the producers and consuming the food made by the producer or they consume the producers themselves these are the consumers and then comes the decomposers which decompose both the producer and the consumers decomposers are mainly fungi and bacteria they break down complex organic matter into a simple form using enzymes the next important term to be learned is detritus detritus is dead organic matter dead plant remains such as leaves flowers bark along with animal decay matter constitute the detritus those who eat detritus are called detritivores they break down detritus into smaller particles by the process called fragmentation earthworm is a detritivore just remember this those who eat detritus are detritivores and detritus is a dead organic matter whereas decomposers decompose complex organic matter with the help of enzymes now steps involved in decomposition number 1 fragmentation breaking down of detritus that is dead plant and animal remains and fecal matter into smaller particles by detritivores or decomposers second leaching it is a process by which these inorganic matters enter the soil next is catabolism process by which detritus is degraded into simpler inorganic substances by bacterial and fungal enzymes next is humification accumulation of humus in the soil that is humus is resistant to microbial action and decomposes at an extremely slow rate it acts as a reservoir of nutrients and finally the mineralization process by which humus further degrades to release minerals into the soil it is an oxygen consuming process and is controlled by the chemical composition of detritus and climatic conditions the next very important factor is energy flow sun is the sole source of energy for all the ecosystem on the earth plants and other photosynthetic organisms utilize less than 50% of the solar radiation known as photosynthetically active radiation par in an ecosystem plants are called producers and all animals depend upon the plants directly or indirectly for their food hence they are known as consumers or heterotrophs the consumers can be further divided into primary consumers that is herbivores secondary consumers or primary carnivores and tertiary consumers that is secondary carnivores now what is trophic level every organism occupies a specific level in their food chain known as the trophic level usually the first trophic level is occupied by plants second by primary consumers and so on now what is standing crop each trophic level contains a certain amount of living material at a specific time known as the standing crop the number of trophic levels in a food chain is restricted since the energy transfer follows the 10% law that is only 10% of the energy is transferred from a lower trophic level to higher one 
now energy pyramids the energy relationship between the different trophic level is represented by the ecological pyramids their base represents the producers or the first trophic level while the apex represents the tertiary or top level consumer ecological pyramids are of three types pyramid of number pyramid of biomass and pyramid of energy in most ecosystem the three pyramids are upright except in some cases the pyramid of biomass is inverted in an ocean ecosystem since a small standing crop of phytoplankton supports a large number of zooplankton in that case the pyramid of biomass is inverted also the pyramid of numbers can be inverted when say a large tree is eaten by small insects however the pyramid of energy is always upright remember this this can be a potential question the pyramid of energy is always upright a trophic level represents a functional level and not a single species as such also a single species may become a part of more than one trophic level in the same ecosystem at the same time depending upon the role it plays in the ecosystem now there are some limitations of ecological pyramids the ecological pyramid do not take into account the same species belonging to more than one trophic level it assumes a simple food chain that rarely exists in nature in nature we find food webs so the ecological pyramids do not explain food webs saprophytes are not given a place in ecological pyramids even though they play a vital role in the ecosystem saprophytes are fungus or microorganism that lives on dead or decaying organic matter now let us discuss the next important concept ecological succession now if we talk about a living system there will be changes too these changes lead to ecological successions by definition the gradual and fairly predictable change in the species composition of a given area is called ecological succession now these changes lead finally to a community that is near equilibrium with the environment that is known as climax community talking about communities there exist an essential community called the pioneer community which invades a bare area pioneer species are hardy species that are the first to colonize previously disrupted or damaged ecosystems beginning a chain of ecological succession that ultimately leads to a more biodiverse steady state ecosystem example bacteria fungi or lichens and talking about successions let us get to know more about the two main types of successions primary succession and secondary succession succession is a process that starts in an area where no living organisms are there these areas where no living organisms ever existed say bare rock lost all the living organisms that existed the former is called primary succession now once we know what ecological succession is we will understand what a seer is a seral community is an intermediate state found in ecological succession in an ecosystem advancing towards its climax community explanation to this is a seral community also known as seer is the name given to each group of plants with the succession in many cases more than one seral stage evolves until climax conditions are attained these are transitory plant communities depending upon the substrate and climate a seral community can be one of the following hydrosphere a community in the water lithosphere a community on rocks zamosphere a community on sand xerosphere a community in a dry area and halosphere community in a saline area example marsh if the succession takes place in wet area it is hydrarch succession if it take place in dry areas it is xerarch succession 
Before moving further, it is important to know about food web and the food chain. Food chain is a single straight chain of organisms from the producer to the final consumer. Whereas different interconnected food chains are called food web. A food chain outlines who eats whom. A food web is all of the food chains in an ecosystem. In nature, we hardly find a food chain. We mostly find a food web. Now let us talk about a very important thing that is the nutrient cycle. We very well know that all organisms need a constant supply of nutrients to grow, reproduce and perform various body functions. The fact is this, nutrients are never lost in nature. They are always recycled. These nutrient cycles are also called biogeochemical cycles. Nutrient cycles are of two types, gaseous and sedimentary. Now what are gaseous cycles? Here reservoirs of these types of cycles exist in the atmosphere. For example, carbon cycle is example of gaseous cycle. The next is sedimentary cycle. Reservoirs of these type of cycles exist in the earth's crust. For example, phosphorus cycle. The first cycle that we are learning in this chapter is carbon cycle. About 49% of the dry weight of living organism is made up of carbon. The ocean reserves and fossil fuels regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plant absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for photosynthesis of which a certain amount is released back through respiratory activities. A major amount of CO2 is contributed by the decomposers who contribute to the CO2 pool by processing dead and decaying matter. Decomposers that we learned earlier secrete enzymes and transfer complex organic matter into the simple organic matter. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increased considerably by human activities such as burning of fossil fuels and deforestation and it has detrimental effects of which we will learn about in the chapter of environmental issues. The next important cycle that we are going to learn is phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is an important constituent in our DNA, cell membranes and nucleic acids and cellular energy transfer system. Rocks contain phosphorus in the form of phosphate. When rocks are weathered, some of the phosphates get dissolved in the soil solution and are absorbed by plants. Consumers get their phosphorus from plants. Phosphorus returns back to the soil by the action of phosphate solubilizing microbes PSMs on dead organisms. Some important PSM that is phosphate solubilizing microbes are Pseudomonas, Bacillus, Micrococcus, Asparagus, Fusarium etc. in soil. So this is it from the chapter of ecosystem. Let us begin this session with a simple definition of biodiversity. As suggested by the name, bio means living and diversity means variety. Thus, the variety of living organism present at a place is known as biodiversity. Different plants, animals, marine life, microorganisms, insects, habitats, ecosystem, etc that makes our planet so unique and so fascinating. This term is popularized by the German sociologist Edward Wilson to describe combined diversity at all levels of biological organization. The most important of them are genetic diversity, a single species that shows high diversity at the genetic level over its distributional range. For example, India has more than 50,000 genetically different strain of rice and 1,000 varieties of mangoes. Species diversity that is the diversity at species level. For example, Western Ghats have a greater amphibian species than Eastern Ghats. The next is ecological diversity, the diversity at the ecosystem level. 
India has a variety of ecosystem with its deserts, rainforest, mangroves, wetlands, estuaries, coral reefs and alpine meadows. Diversity of life is not evenly distributed. Tropical region supports more life than polar region. That's why India has greater ecosystem diversity than other Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland. These countries are located near to polar region. India has taken million of years of evolution to accumulate this rich diversity in nature. But we could lose all that wealth in less than two centuries if the present rates of species loss continues. You know how many species are there on earth and how many in India? It is not easy to answer the question of how many species there are on earth. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, IUCN, in 2004, the total number of plant and animal species described so far is slightly more than 1.5 million. But we have no clear idea of how many species are yet to be discovered and described. More than 70% of all the species recorded are animals, while plants including algae, fungi, bryophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms comprise no more than 22% of the total. Among animals, insects are the most species-rich taxonomic group, making more than 70% of the total. That means out of every 10 animals on this planet, 7 are insects. Again, how do we explain this enormous diversification of insects? The number of fungi species in the world is more than the combined total of the species of fishes, amphibians, reptiles and mammals. India has only 2.4% of the land area of the world, but its share of the global species diversity is an impressive 8.1%. That is what makes our country one of the 12 mega diversity countries of the world. Nearly 45,000 species of plants and twice as many of animals have been recorded from India. Did you know how many living species are actually there waiting to be discovered and named? If we accept May's global estimates, only 22% of the total species have been recorded so far. Probably more than 1 lakh plant species and more than 3 lakh animal species are yet to be discovered and described. Now let us discuss the next important concept that is patterns of biodiversity. Diversity of plants and animals is not uniform throughout the world. Some of the patterns of biodiversity are latitudinal gradient. In this pattern species diversity decreased from equator towards poles. There are greater number of species in tropics as compared to temperate and polar region. For example, Colombia, which is located near to the equator, has nearly 1400 species of birds, while New York at 41 degree north has 105 species and Greenland, which is further located at 71 degree north, has only 56 species. So we can conclude that as we go away from the equator, number of species decreases. This is because tropical latitudes have remained relatively undisturbed for millions of years, thus had a long evolutionary time for species diversification. Tropical environments are less seasonal, relatively more constant and predictable. Such constant environments promote niche specialization and lead to a greater species diversity. There is more solar energy available in the tropics. Because of this, there is more species diversity near the equator. Species Area Relationships The great German naturalist and geographer Alexander von Humboldt observed that within a region, species richness increased with increasing explored area, but only up to a limit. Now let us discuss what is the importance of species diversity to the ecosystem. Does the number of species in a community really matter to the functioning of the ecosystem? This is a question for which ecologists have been able to give a definitive answer. For many decades, ecologists believed that communities with more species generally tend to be more stable than those with less species. 
A stable community should not show too much variation in productivity from year to year. It must be either resistant or resilient to occasional disturbances. These disturbances can be both natural or man-made. It must also be resistant to invasions by alien species. We don't know how these attributes are linked to species richness in a community, but a David Tillman's long-term ecosystem experiments using outdoor plots provide some tentative answers. Tillman found that plots with more species showed less year-to-year -year variation in total biomass. He also showed that in his experiments, increased diversity contributed to higher productivity. Hence, we realize that rich biodiversity is not only essential for ecosystem health as well as for the survival of the human race on this planet. And now, loss of biodiversity. The biological wealth of our planet has been declining rapidly and the accusing finger is clearly pointing to human activities. The last 20 years alone have witnessed the disappearance of 27 species. Now this data is as per NCRT which was written in 2007. Loss of biodiversity in a region may lead to decline in plant production. Second, lowered resistance to environmental perturbations such as drought. And finally, increased variability in certain ecosystem processes such as plant productivity, water use and pest and disease cycles. Did you know the causes of biodiversity losses? The first one is habitat loss and fragmentation. Habitat loss occurs when natural habitats are converted to human uses such as crop plant, urban areas and infrastructure development. For example, once tropical rainforest covered 14% of the earth's land, but now only 6% of it is tropical rainforest and rest is used by humans. Second is overexploitation of natural resources by humans resulting in degradation and extinction of the resources. For example, stellar sea cow, passenger pigeon and many marine fishes have extincted in the last 500 years because of over exploitation of natural resources by humans. The third is alien species invasion. When alien species are introduced unintentionally, it may become invasive and cause decline to the indigenous native species. For example, when Nile perch was introduced into Lake Victoria in East Africa, it led to extinction of cichlid fish in the lake. Now the next cause of decline of biodiversity is co-extinction. When a species become extinct, the plant and animal species associated with it in an obligatory way also become extinct. For example, when a fish is extinct, the parasite associated in an obligatory manner on that fish also become extinct. Now while hearing all this, the question that pops in our mind is why should we conserve biodiversity? Conservation of biodiversity is considered under three categories narrowly utilitarian, broadly utilitarian and ethical. The broadly utilitarian argument says to conserve biodiversity because of the morals and the responsibility that humans have towards nature and as biodiversity plays a major role in many ecosystem services, we should conserve biodiversity. On the other hand, the narrow utilitarian criteria of biology conservation of diversity are the one where the humans conserve biodiversity because of needs. But we need to realize that every species has an intrinsic value. Even if it may not be of current or any economic value to us, we have the power and with power comes the great responsibility. So it is our moral duty to care for their well-being and pass on our biological legacy in good order to our future generations. Now how do we conserve biodiversity? There are two basic approaches to conserve biodiversity in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. In situ conservation is also known as on site conservation. Conservation and protection of species in their natural habitat, that is, on site conservation. Now, biodiversity hotspots are type of in situ conservation. Regions with very high levels of species richness and high degree of endemism that are identified for maximum protection. Here, endemism means species confined to a region 
and not found elsewhere. There are 36 biodiversity hotspots in the world, out of which four are in India. The Himalayas, the Western Ghats, the Indo-Burma region and the Sunda land that includes Nicobar group of islands. Now in NCRT, this data is different. It has written that there are 34 hotspots in the world, out of which three are in India. These are Western Ghats and Sri Lanka, Indo-Burma and Himalaya. In India, ecologically unique and biodiversity rich regions are legally protected as biosphere reserves, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Now what are sacred grooves? Tracts of forest where all the trees and wildlife within are worshipped and given total protection. Hunting and logging are usually strictly prohibited within these patches. For example, Khasi and Jaintia hills in Meghalaya. Example 2 is Western Ghats of Karnataka and Maharashtra and 3 Sarguja, Chanda and Bastar areas of Madhya Pradesh where you can find such sacred grooves. Now this is an example of in situ conservation. Now what is ex situ conservation? It is also known as off site conservation. Here conservation of threatened species in special setting where they are protected and given special care that is off site conservation. It has been protected by following method. First zoological park. Many animals that have become extinct in the wild but continued to be maintained in zoological parks. Also there are botanical gardens. Also wildlife safari is an example of ex situ because wildlife is brought from their natural habitat and placed in special setting. Cryo preservation techniques are also the example of ex situ conservation. Using this technique, the gametes of threatened species can be preserved in viable and fertile condition for long periods. Then the eggs can be fertilized using in vitro techniques. Seed bank is also an example of ex situ conservation. Using this method, seeds of different genetic strains of commercially important plants can be kept for a long periods. Now biodiversity conservation measures at a global level. Biodiversity knows no political boundaries and its conservation is therefore a collective responsibility of all nations. Now here we will take a look at two important summits or organization, the Earth Summit. It was a meeting of several nations at Rio de Janeiro in 1992 to discuss appropriate measures for conservation of biodiversity. We are looking into this because this is mentioned in NCRT. Also, the World Summit on Sustainable Development 2002. It was meeting of several nations in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2002 to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. Basically, it was awareness campaign which included tens of thousands of participants including head of state and government, national delegates and leaders from non-governmental organizations. The aim of this meeting was to divert the focus of world and providing direct action towards meeting difficult challenges including improving people's lives and conserving our natural resources. In a world that is growing in population with ever increasing demands for food, water, shelter, sanitation, energy, health services and economic security. So this is why it is important for us to conserve the biodiversity. Let us begin with the last and the most important chapter of environment and ecology, the environmental issues. The human population is increasing day by day. With that, the requirement for resources is increasing too. We are putting pressure on our natural resources and as a result, we are polluting air, water and soil. Now what is pollution? Pollution is the undesirable change brought by chemical, particulate matter or biological materials to air, water or soil. Agents that bring such undesirable change are called pollutants. Now in this chapter, we are learning three major kinds of pollution, air, water and soil. Let us begin our discussion with air pollution. 
Air is a complex and dynamic natural entity which is essentially supporting life on earth. Air pollutant is a substance that causes harm to humans and other living organisms. Some of the common pollutants of air are nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. Air pollution is harmful. It causes severe respiratory disorders in humans and other animals and also affects plants, but it can be controlled. In factories, you can fit smokestacks with filters to separate pollutants from the harmless gases. If vertical pipe is taller, harmful gases disperse pollutants over a wider area in order to minimize their impact. Also, particulate matter can be removed by using electrostatic precipitator in a system plant for removing the dust from flue gases. A scrubber can be used to remove gases such as sulfur dioxide wherein the exhaust passes through a spray of water or lime. Vehicular pollution can be reduced by using less polluting fuels such as CNG which is more efficient and less costly as compared to petrol or diesel. Also use of electric vehicles can improve air quality too. With no tailpipe, pure electric cars produce no carbon dioxide emissions when driving. This can reduce air pollution considerably. Vehicles can be fitted with catalytic converters that have metals such as platinum, palladium and rhodium as catalyst. These catalysts carry out the following conversions. Unburned hydrocarbons is converted to carbon dioxide and water. Carbon monoxide is converted to carbon dioxide. Nitric oxide is converted to nitrogen gas. Now let us move to much talked about phenomena when it comes to pollution. The greenhouse effect. It is a natural phenomenon that keeps the earth's atmosphere warm. Without this phenomenon, the temperature of the earth would become too cold for living beings to survive. It is like blanket which keeps us warm. The greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, etc. absorb the heat of the sun and the earth and emit it back to earth's surface. Thus, these gases prevent a part of heat rays from escaping into the atmosphere. This cycle is repeated many times to maintain the earth's temperature to an optimum 15 degrees Celsius. This system seems good and working. Then what is the issue? The concentration of these gases has increased due to increased industrialization leading to the heating up of the earth's surface that is global warming. This has increased the overall temperature of the earth resulting in changes in the earth's climate. During the last century, the temperature of the earth has increased by 0.6 degrees Celsius as per NCRT. This increase in temperature is ultimately believed to cause the melting of polar ice caps, rise in the sea level and submerging of the coastal areas. Now how you can minimize the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect can be controlled by reducing the use of fossil fuels which produce greenhouse gases from burning, afforestation, inefficient energy use, etc. So precaution can be better than cure. Next is water pollution. Water is very essential. Because of human activities, water bodies have become polluted all over the world. Some of the common pollutants and their sources are domestic sewage, industrial effluents, thermal wastewater discharge and etc. Now let us discuss them one by one. Domestic sewage. It mainly contains organic matter which is biodegradable. Microorganisms involved in their degradation consume a lot of oxygen and this is the biological oxygen demand of the water body. This BOD increases leading to the death of fishes and other aquatic life. Now what is BOD that is biological oxygen demand? It represents the amount of oxygen consumed by bacteria and other organisms while they decompose organic matter under aerobic conditions at a specified temperature. Aerobic conditions means where oxygen is present. The more the biological oxygen demand means the more is the pollution. Sewage also contains many pathogenic microbes which may cause the outbreak of many diseases such as typhoid, jaundice, etc. The next is industrial effluents. Industrial effluents contain inorganic toxic substance which may undergo biomagnification. 
Now, what is biomagnification? It means increase in concentration of a toxin at a successive trophic level. The toxin gets accumulated in the body of an organism and is passed on to the next level. For example, DDT and other heavy metals such as mercury, cadmium, etc. are passed on to the human plate via fishes. The next is thermal wastewater discharge. Heated water flowing out of the thermal power plants increases the temperature of the water body. It eliminates the cold water species and promotes the warm water species. In the long run, it causes damage to the indigenous biodiversity of the water body. Now, eutrophication. What is eutrophication? It is the aging of a water body due to nutrient enrichment of its water. Eutrophication can be natural or artificial. The natural process takes thousands of years, but due to human activities, this process has got accelerated. Release of nutrient-rich sewage and industrial effluents leads to introduction of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus and increase in temperature and biological oxygen demand of the water body, causing increased biological activity, thereby leading to algal blooms. This results in the loss of indigenous flora and fauna. In some cases, large masses of floating plants, that is bog, is developed, finally converting the water body into land. It is essential that you control water pollution. Raw sewage can be treated using biological and other means to remove the solid, suspended and inorganic materials before it is released back into the environment. Nitrogenous fertilizers can be denitrified using microbes which can convert nitrate and nitrite into gaseous nitrogen by the process called denitrification. Integrated wastewater management as practiced in Arcata, California can be adopted to control water pollution. In this approach, the water is first treated by conventional means such as filtration, sedimentation and chlorine treatment followed by bioremediation. Now what is bioremediation? Use of living organisms like microbes and bacteria in the removal of containments, pollutants and toxins from soil, water and other environments. These microbes assimilate heavy metals. Bioremediation is used to clean up oil spills or contaminated groundwater. Now what is solid waste? It consists of all the unwanted, undesired materials thrown into dustbin. It may be composed of biodegradable or non-biodegradable waste. Open dumps used for disposing of solid waste serves as breeding ground for rats and flies. Therefore, sanitary landfills are used as substitute for this. Biodegradable waste can be either aerobically or anaerobically broken down using microbes. This non-biodegradable waste can be recycled, reused or dumped in landfills. Hospital waste also contains hazardous materials which have to be disposed properly. Hospital wastes are generally incinerated, that is, they are burnt up. Irreparable computers and other electronic goods make up a e-waste which are either dumped in landfills or are incinerated too, that is destroying by burning. E-waste can be recycled also to recover metals such as copper, iron, silicon, gold, etc. The most effective and innovative way to use the plastic waste is use of polyblend, a fine powder or recycled modified plastic. When a polyblend is mixed with bitumen, it can be used to lay roads with greater water repellent capacity and greater life. Now what is bitumen? Bitumen is a sticky, black, viscous, semi-solid form of petroleum used in road construction, waterproofing and so on. Now agrochemicals. The increased use of pesticides, fertilizers for increasing agriculture production has accelerated the process of eutrophication and biomagnifications in water sources. In order to check this, the concept of organic farming is increasingly becoming popular. In this technique, instead of using chemical fertilizers and pesticides, natural materials and techniques such as organic manure, compost, biological pest control and crop rotations are used. This leads to a balanced soil which does not cause soil infertility but causes the rejuvenation of the soil. 
So far, only Sikkim has managed to become a fully organic state in India. Now, radioactive waste. Nuclear energy is non-polluting energy except for the threats posed by accidental leakage and difficult disposal of radioactive waste. Radioactive substances cause severe damage such as mutations and cancer in lower doses and higher doses can be lethal. So what is the right way to treat radioactive waste? Radioactive waste should be suitably pre-treated in shielded containers buried under rock surface about 500 meter under the earth's surface. Now improper utilization of resources. Natural resources can be degraded by their improper use. Soil erosion and desertification, over cultivation, over grazing, deforestation and poor irrigation techniques lead to soil erosion and desertification. Water logging and soil salinity. Lack of proper drainage leads to water logging which affects the crops and also leads to an increase in the salinity of the soil. Moving ahead, one of the most essential concerns that we are facing is ozone depletion. We have learned that ozone layer is found in the upper part of the stratosphere. It protects the earth, humans and other organisms from the harmful UV rays of the sun. High energy UV rays have the potential to break the bonds within the molecules such as DNA and proteins. Ozone is formed by the action of UV rays on oxygen molecules and its thickness is measured in Dobson units DU. The ozone layer is essential for survival. It saves us from the UV rays. The UV rays are dangerous. The shorter wavelengths of UV rays cause skin cancers, mutations in the cellular DNA. Also it causes snow blindness, cataracts, etc. Now what is the concern? The ozone layer is getting depleted by the action of humans. Why? Chlorofluorocarbons CFCs are found in refrigerants and perfumes that react with UV rays in the stratosphere and Cl atoms are liberated in this process which acts as a catalyst in the degradation of the ozone into molecular oxygen. The ozone depletion is particularly greater in Antarctica resulting in the formation of large thinned ozone layer commonly known as the ozone hole. In 2021, the ozone layer was 8 times the size of India. To check this ozone depletion, Montreal Protocol was passed in 1987 to control the use of substances that cause ozone depletion. Now let us learn the last subtopic that is deforestation. What is deforestation? It is the unlimited cutting of trees and conversion of forest into cultivable lands. At the beginning of the 20th century, India had 30% of its area under forest, which was reduced to just 19.4% by the end of the 20th century. Deforestation is a consequence of a number of human activities, such as increased population and the demand for land. Trees are also cut for timber, fuel, etc. Also, slash and burn agriculture, also called jhum cultivation, is responsible for deforestation. In this, trees are cut and plant remains in the forest are burned since the ash acts as a fertilizer. Some of the major effects of the deforestation are the increase in carbon dioxide levels, loss of habitat for wild animals, soil erosion and consequent desertification. Deforestation can be controlled by reforestation and afforestation. In the 1980s, the concept of joint forest management was introduced by the government of India. In this, support of local communities was taken for the conservation of forest and in return, the local people were free to use the products obtained from the forest. So, this is all from this video. This was the video regarding environmental pollution. Here we learned air pollution, water pollution and solid waste. We also learned about ozone hole and deforestation. So this is all from this video. I hope you like this video. If you have any doubts, please comment below in the comment box.